so from one disruptive beauty company to another, our next speaker is Emily Weiss, the founder of Glossier. Uh, Emily and I first met in the early days of the fashion blogosphere on the Fashion Week circuit. At the time, BOF was still being run from my sofa, and Emily was writing her blog into the gloss as a side hustle from a day job working in big established media companies. She didn't know that that blog would lead her to build a community that would help her to shape one of the most talked about new beauty companies on the planet, Glossier, which has secured over $34 million in venture capital funding. Today, Emily will talk to BOF contributing editor Alexandra Schulman, who stepped down this year as editor-in-chief of British Vogue after 25 years, making her the editor with the longest tenure in the history of a magazine and someone uniquely, someone uniquely positioned to understand how Emily is disrupting beauty. So please welcome Alexandra and Emily. Hi, how are you? Well, the first thing I have to say is that I had incredibly good fun researching this talk. Um, as somebody that's well known for only, if I put some eyeliner on, I think I'm really going like the whole way. And um, so looking at Into the Gloss and spending really quite a lot of time reading like the top shelf and the videos and everything, it, for me, it was like reading about kind of anthropological study of some weird tribe in the middle of an ocean I'd never even heard of. Um, and what I was really, really struck by was um, how many products people use, how many products they have this kind of passion about and have this feeling of a kind of emotional engagement to. And um, so I was thinking about how that must have been a kind of starting point for you when you, you conceived of the blog and, f and feeling that you could have a kind of community that were, was based on, on this kind of passion. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so um, it's interesting. Uh, my background is, is in fashion. Um, Definitely very different from yours. I was a you know, 20, 20 something, early 20s, uh, you know, measly fashion assistant. Um, at uh, some of the best, you know, media companies in the world, Vogue and W and, and Teen Vogue, and I had this incredible exposure to, uh, you know, Carly Kloss when she was 15, and I was tying her shoes on uh, the back <laughs> of a, you know, van before a photo shoot, or um, Pat McGrath doing makeup or hair, and surrounded by these incredible women. And uh, the thing that I always wanted to ask them was, who does your hair? You know, what, uh, what's that lipstick? Um, and what I didn't realize is that actually, uh, even though those circumstances circumstances are incredibly, um, let's, uh, you know, unusual and unique, that uh, mentality, that sharing mentality is actually, uh, as Moj just said, um, the most popular way to discover a new beauty product. So today, 60% of women uh, in the U.S. say that the number one reason that they're convinced to buy a new beauty product that they haven't tried before is through a peer-to-peer -peer recommendation. And the definition of that peer-to-peer -peer recommendation is uh, likely a social media person they've never met before, but it's someone they follow on Instagram. It's also someone they read about on Into the Gloss. Um, and so Into the Gloss, while it uh, really pioneered a shift in beauty content from being um, brand or editor straight to consumer, uh, it put a person in the middle of that, uh, sharing their routine. That really wasn't, you know, uh, it was incredibly unique for, um, let's say, media at the time. But if you look at YouTube, um, certainly it's not, uh, it's, it, it, they did it first, right? And beauty is the second most popular category on YouTube um, right now. So uh, I do think, though, what Into the Gloss did um, still resonates true to our company seven years later, uh, which is people. People are the unlock to shopping today. And uh, whether it's beauty or uh, fashion or um, blenders, whatever it is that you're considering buying, you've probably uh, read a review about it or read you know, a deep dive um, on Into the Gloss about it. And uh, that shift in um, democracy and, and really giving women voices to uh, be their own experts and share wherever they are at in their beauty journey um, uh, was incredibly important to me. 
Yeah, I, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking that um, I think there's a big difference between fashion and beauty in that I sense that, uh, and we, we heard this just before now, that beauty products aren't seen as something um, that is uh, in some way kind of, well, it is seen, let's be more positive here, they are seen as being empowering and positive and part of a kind of a self-improvement. Um, and I don't think that, that fashion is so much. And do you think that maybe that idea that they are about this kind of empowerment and, and in self-improvisation self is um, leads people to want to share the information and to have that conversation rather than to kind of keep it to themselves and be slightly secretive about it? Well, I think there's, I, I think in many ways, um, you know, beauty once had uh, a, a real stigma around it. Um, I, I know even today there's uh, a sentiment often expressed that's um, this kind of beauty shaming, right? I like to call it. So in the old days when I was uh, shooting and editing into the gloss myself, now we have a, a very talented group of, um, of editors doing that. I've probably many in this room, I've sat in your bathroom uh, bathrooms and shot your top shelf with your, your beauty products. Uh, one of the most common sentiments would be, I'd say, well, tell me about your beauty routine and they would say oh me I'm I'm really low maintenance <laughs> and I'd say well I don't know let's talk about it let me let me see what you got and then I go in and you know an hour and a half later I've got you know a list of a hundred and you know 20 products and so um, I, I think this kind of um, stigma comes from the perfectionism and the completeness and the um, authoritarianism that uh, used to drive beauty purchasing decisions um, through brands or editors uh, pre-social media and pre-technology. And in this age of sharing, um, I think it has really destigmatized beauty. It's really made it something that um, women just want to help each other out and men want to help each other out. And um, it, it's really about saying, hey, I'm proud of where I'm at. Uh, I am proud to be on a journey. I, am, I, I have not reached a final destination. In fact, there is no final destination. The airbrushed pictures um, that are you know, put into media outlets uh, uh, by brands, they're not resonating. A UGC picture is res resonating, user, user generated user-generated content. Um, and, and so I think, um, I think the moment we're in, uh, you know, I can speak to it for beauty, but I wonder if it's not the same for fashion. I think we are in an era of personal style. We are in an era where um, the information is out there, it's prevalent, the inspiration is out there, and the fulfillment is also out there. And both are mostly happening um, online for this new generation. And in terms of, uh, of your community, I mean, I, I hate to use such old-fashioned terms as, as kind of women and age, but um, did, it, it strikes me that the conversation that's going on, on into the gloss is, is very much a certain demographic, however. I mean, they are of a certain age group and they're of a, of a certain mindset and it is very much about... Um, being very kind of positive and inspirational and, and open and sharing, which I think is actually quite a generational shift because I don't think my own generation have quite that natural feeling about everything. Um, and was that something that you originally wanted to be part of it? D did you intend that or is that something that's grown up through the conversation that's happened? Um, you know, it's interesting. The audience on Into the Gloss, we have, uh, you know, between two and three million unique visitors from around the world who come every month. Um, th their household income is, is a little bit higher than the Glossier customer. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of, because I think a lot of the profiles that we're doing um, are of women who spend a lot of money on beauty. I mean, you, you know, you can cut it any way you want, but it's, it's expensive. If you were to add up a top shelf, I think actually Victoria Beckham's top shelf, which we did about a month ago to celebrate our launch in the UK of Glossier, I think all the media outlets picked it up and said it was like, you know, if you want to buy Victoria's beauty routine, it's like, you know, $2,000 or something. So that's not going to happen for a pivotal, and they probably don't want Victoria Beckham's beauty routine, right? So um, to use, to use Mo Moja's, I love this pivotal thing. I know I'm obsessed. <laughs> uh, millennials just so tired, you know? It's like so much fresher. Aww, um, so, 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 um, so I think, uh, I think, and then for Glossier, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we, we're three years old as a, as a, as a, as a company, um, and uh, we have, you know, 
tons of, of, of worldwide customers, um, close to a million followers on our Instagram account, 50% from overseas. Uh, so we call them customers they just haven't bought yet. Um, but I think they all share a psychographic more than a demographic. And uh, again, I think whether you are a 45-year-old uh, lawyer who reads into the gloss um, and buys you know, luxury product, or a 18-year-old Glossier customer who um, saves up for boy brow and you know, spends two hours at our New York City store making new friends, uh, I think they all share that similar um, um, desire to, to share because it's helping shape their better, better decisions. You know? and, and, and I think um, who, the beauty of, of today is that no matter what it is, whether it's um, the news, whether it's shopping for beauty products, whether it's who you date, you get to choose now. There's this power of choice because of social media and because of technology in who you're going to listen to. Whose story do you want to believe? You know, do you do you want the first person who comes up to you and is served to you on Bumble or Tinder? No, probably not. You're going to swipe around a little bit, right? And do you want the first person who walks up to you at Sephora? Probably not. You're going to probably go on your iPhone and you know look up best. Sephora, best mascara, and then you know make your own way through Sephora. So I think who you're going to listen to, um, whose story do you want to believe, which narrative um, do you want to believe, uh, is the world we live in. And um, when you created Glossier, uh, I'm calling them followers on Into the Gloss. So you used your followers uh, to create your customers, really, to become your, to make a brand that had customers. And um, did you? So you used them to tell you what they wanted and to have a conversation with them about kind of refining uh, the possibilities of the brand. Uh, did you have any idea what you wanted to create to start off with? Did you guide them in any way? Um, so one of the key learnings from doing hundreds of interviews on Into the Gloss between 2010 and 2013 when we started to build Glossier, um, one of the key learnings that I had was there's this incredible breadth of product, right? Nobody, uh, we all know this, right? We all know this as consumers and as, as, as leaders in industry sitting here today that uh, there's no shortage of stuff, right? Um, there's a shortage of context, um, and there actually is a shortage of um, integrity, I think, in terms of product, product and quality. And I actually think, uh, while luxury is a very loaded word today, I think one of the only um, uh, really core tenets of luxury, whether it's a luxury experience um, or uh, a luxury product, is quality, right? Quality of experience um, and integrity in terms of uh, the values that your company or your brand stands for. And so when we were launching Glossier, the original idea was, uh, let's create a beauty company whose sweatshirt you want to wear as an element, like you're so proud, you're so aligned with that company, it's so relevant to you, it's so, um, uh, so much more than just a product, so much more than just stuff. Um, how can we build that? So how can we build the beauty company of the future that actually involves uh, and evolve, evolves with and evolves with their customer? The customer is a part of the company, it's a part of everything that uh, you put out because there's never been a time more than now where the customer is always right. Um, and so the first four products for Glossier, uh, the idea was to start with skincare and then evolve launching something new every every uh, six to eight weeks, much like a magazine, much like content. So Glossier is actually based on the word dossier. Um, and to do that in conjunction with our community to build the first beauty lifestyle brand, wherein um, we, you can be category agnostic, you can have only hero products, you can launch very few items, very counterintuitive to uh, a lot of the beauty companies that are even launching today, where they launch with you know 150 SKUs, you kind of make everything with one, one vendor, there's things that are great, but there's things that are not so great. Um, we really wanted to, to offer this incredible new luxury experience, and we were able to do that by going, again, direct to consumer, and not be um, beholden to retail partners or wholesalers who are going to make you, your brand become something so that it fits on a certain gondola or a certain you know aisle of a store um, so everything that we've chosen to do has been because it's better for her and she said you know I want incredibly high quality beauty products um, I want you know this product to be um, a ver like I want to create I want to combine these three things to create the ultimate you know uh, beauty product and those are sentiments that I we listen to over years uh, of building into the gloss and we still listen today and 
you know, people often say, how do you make your customer feel involved? I'm, I've sat with so many brands and so many companies when I was on the editor side, and they'd say, we're just trying to figure out how do you make your customer feel involved? And I'd say, just involve her. It's, it's simple, you know, find ways to actually ask her questions and then build that in to, to what you do. Um, when I was at Vogue, uh, one of the concerns I had about the magazine getting involved in um, e-commerce was uh, the kind of the line between how you could be seen to be being a neutral uh, magazine that has authority and advice, and yet you're also kind of selling product through the content of the magazine and using the content of the magazine to sell, uh, sell the product. Um, but that that is sort of exactly what, what you are doing. How do you, um, how do you protect your kind of um, neutrality as, as far as your followers are concerned? I mean, I noticed that in almost everything, there's one Glossier product put in, for instance. Um, so the, the mandate for Into the Gloss has always been, uh, since the beginning, to be inspired, period. That's what I tell my editors. Um, that's how I feel. Uh, it is a platform for talking about the best in beauty. Um, we actually uh, stopped being a media business um, when we launched Glossier so that we could do even more of that. Let's create, let's just focus on premium content. Let's foc on, focus on uh, telling, telling women um, the best about beauty across the internet and across the world. Um, it so happens that, you know, Glossier products are everywhere. They're in a lot of women's top shelves um, all across the world. Uh, we've got a lot of customers, global demand, um, and they're really incredible products. So we've always taken the approach, and it's a great question. It's something we thought a lot about of, we're just gonna keep being inspired and talking about things we like. We're very proud of the products we make. We spend a ton of time working on them. So we're gonna talk about those products, and the beauty of Into the Gloss today is it's not only a fantastic place for discovery and for, um, uh, uh, beauty discovery, but it's also an incredible place to give us feedback. It's our number one uh, microphone if we want to tell customers and readers um, when and why we're going international or why we've sold out of everything or ask them what they want in a candle scent. We can gather all of that information and we can share all of those stories on, on Into the Gloss. Um, Emily, listening to you, uh, today and having seen you on, on the site. Uh, you strike me as not really that different from somebody like Estee Lauder or Elizabeth Arden or Helena Rubinstein a century ago in that they were these uh, pioneering women who had a vision and uh, used to go out and talk to their customers all the time and became very much the kind of the figurehead for their brands. And even though they may not physically have been used in any kind of marketing and certainly they didn't have videos or social media or anything, the idea of that woman and her life was very much a part of those um, cosmetic companies. And I think you have become very um, much a part of Into the Gloss and, and Glossier and a lot of the young girls who buy your products, they, they buy them because they kind of love the way that you look and you speak and your voice and everything. Um, how do you feel about not being there physically yourself? Do you think you will always be there or would you ever envisage a time where it, uh, Glossier and Into the Gloss could survive without you? Well, you know, you, you, earlier you used the word anthropology, and I, I believe that my job is to be a conduit. Um, my job has always been to listen. It's been to uh, make people happy. That's my job um, through what we do at Glossier. And uh, I love women. I love people. I love the power that people have already. Um, so I actually... Uh, kind of recently realized I don't really like the word em empowered. It's like we're in a moment where people are just powerful, period. Um, and we want to help them unlock that power um, or just realize that power. Um, and so my voice is actually, on, a, on an individual level, not nearly as important. I'm a drop in the bucket compared to all of the voices of our customers and of our readers. And that's the biggest difference between a time like, um, and thank you, by the way, um, you know, these titans of industry, these pioneering women, the Estee Lauders, the Helena Rubensteins, there was no YouTube then. There was no social media. Media. So their customers had no platform. Uh, it was just them. They had an incredible amount writing on, you know, what was their message of um, what these products would 
would unlock for you know these these women who followed them, um, riding on their shoulders. So you know it's interesting. Estee Lauder, you know, she changed her name. It was Esther Esther Metzger, I believe. And so the stories and the narratives that these women needed to craft and embody um, were ones that at the moment I think worked really well. Those were the values of the time, uh, you know, the the image of the time, the social status of the time, the um, aspiration of the time. Uh, those were timely values. Values. Those were timely narratives, but today, um, you know, the the values have changed, and our core value at Glossier is inclusivity. So, um, you know, again, my voice is one of many, and even Glossier, the actual company, our voice is one of many. Um, we are not the rule makers. We are not the king and queen makers. We are just providing product and platform and uh, content so that, that it become tools for other women to write their stories. Well, thanks very much. And can I just end by saying, I think that your cloud paint is absolutely brilliant. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.